Please rise. The text for today's scripture is, is taken from Romans 8, 1 through 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of the sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Heavenly Father, look upon us as we meditate your word today and grant us the ability to grow in sanctification. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Dear fellow redeemed, so how well do you like our just, uh, the justice system that works in our country today? What a loaded question. For the most part, and when we feel charitable, we would probably say it seems to work. However, I'm sure we could find instances of abuse and we wouldn't have to look too far. I think all of us have heard of the, just, the justice that is not served. Cases where a first time offender gets the book thrown at him, and on the other hand, a hardened criminal seems to only get a slap on the wrists, or may not only <clears throat> get an exceptionally short sentence, but that he's also quick released for good behavior or, or getting off on a minor technicality. When we hear of instances like this, we are dismayed because the guilty have walked away without proper punishment. The worst case is when someone else's life is taken by another person. We hear of judgments such as life without the possibility of parole. We also may hear that the imposed sentence of death by lethal injection. And yet in our country there is still a lengthy appeal system where the case seems to go on forever or the sentence is never imposed because the law changes. In such cases, it appears that our judicial system is out of whack. Originally, capital punishment was set up to deter crimes with the threat of severe, swift, and just punishment. It used to work. In modern times, it doesn't seem to work as well, as swiftness has gone by the wayside. Crime seems to pay. In contrast to man's judicial system, there is God's. In some ways, we may be tempted to think uh, that God's system is flawed also, as much as what man's is. We remember the words of the psalmist, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? We also remember the words of Isaiah, the law is paralyzed. Most certainly this is not the case. God is not slow in administering justice in terms of eternity. Every day he counts people's sins, he records them, he holds them up as evidence. Every day he counts down the time of grace people have. And when the time is over, judgment comes. When the Lord enters his court, justice will be served. For because of <clears throat> our inherited sin and personal sins, we are guilty until proven innocent. That conviction has already been made. The sentence of eternal death has been pronounced and it will be carried out. No one will escape. There are no appeals. There are no do-overs. Paul wants us to understand how God's system works. He wants us to understand what we can expect to hear when we enter that court. By ourselves, there is only one sentence, condemned to eternal death and the unimaginable torments of hell. But this is what Paul shares with us today because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. There is another proclamation. Jesus frees us from all condemnation. The Father cannot and will not be able to hold our sins against us. 
Rather than those shackles in ugly jail clothes, we will be adorned in the beautiful robes of righteousness which Christ has put on us with his innocent suffering. When Paul wrote these, <clears throat> wrote the Christians in Rome, they were experiencing great joys and great challenges. The congregation had come out of a Jewish synagogue as most churches did back then. There was a Jewish element and there was a Gentile element. In either case, people did not understand their new relationship with the law, <clears throat> with the law of the Lord because Christ had fulfilled the law they, that they knew. Paul wanted and needed this, this, <clears throat> this view to change. He wanted them to understand that the law was powerless to do anything to change their spiritual situation. So on <clears throat> in their own, he began the process of addressing this diverse group. Chapters 7 and 8 of the Book of Romans are a beautiful presentation of both law and gospel. Paul goes out of his way to make certain everything is perfectly pure, clear. To the Jewish people, he appealed to what they knew <clears throat> about the law, that law that had been given to their forefathers on Mount Sinai. It was given to them to set, apart as, to set them apart as God's holy people. How strange they must have looked to their heathen nations. You can only have one God. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. These laws that were written down, and then on top of that, all the <clears throat> dietary laws that he had asked, and all the festivals that he had asked them to, to do. It was also given to keep them in the right relationship with the Lord. The sacrificial animals reminded the Israelites of the severity of their sins. This was the Lord's intention for the people of Israel, but they sinned through rebellion, <clears throat> and finally over time, those reminders of God's suffering became requirements. And thus, the law became a source of justice for them one that they simply could not keep. Should we not know the severity of sins? In Hebrews 9, 22, let me read. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The Gentiles, on the other hand, were another story. Paul couldn't appeal to their heritage and their history because they had not gotten the written law from the Lord. He did appeal, however, to their natural knowledge of God. He simply said, you too are not without excuse, okay? Although you haven't a written law like the Jews, God wrote a law in your heart. This served the same purpose as God's written law to Israel. Paul also appeared, appealed to the Christian Gentiles in a logical manner. His arguments were sophisticated and flawless. Yet the conclusion was the same. The law only brought condemnation as the law only can. As his hearers came to grips with this message as well as their sin, they began to realize that they deserved something from the Lord, but it wasn't good. It is the same realization that we need to come to also. In many ways, are we not like those early Christians in Rome? We look at ourselves and our Lutheran heritage. We look at our lives and our good works and we conclude, eh, I'm not too bad. And so we fall into, we may fall into the trap of doing good works for the wrong reason to perhaps fulfill the law. And when we live our lives according to the law, when we think how <clears throat> our lives will merit something good from God, we're only fooling ourselves. As Paul clearly states, the law is powerless to do anything in that it, weakened, it, is, that it is weakened by sinful nature. 
Keeping the law can do nothing for us. In fact, it becomes an effort of util infutility. It is impossible to keep the law as God requires and deserves. And it, it is at this time that the law becomes an overbearing master who gives no commendation or satisfaction. It only points out errors and flaws. It gives us no wiggle room. It only proclaims condemnation. It screams that we deserve only the judgment of guilty and the punishment of hell and death. And this is the only thing we deserve to hear. However, Paul had a different message. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. These beautiful, comforting words are familiar. They are also our source of joy and freedom. But remember where the emphasis is. It should always be on Jesus and what he has done for us. For Paul continues, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. What we ourselves were unable to do by the means of the law, Jesus accomplished for us with his, with his holy life and his innocent death. We can never hear those words enough. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. In the Old Testament, God set up sacrifices to remind the people what needed to be done to take away their sins. A sacrifice had to be offered. Something had to give up its life and shed its blood. Daily, thousands of people would come to the temple. Daily, animals would be killed and burned on the altar. But then daily, the people would, could walk away knowing that God had removed their sins. Today, we do not offer sacrifices because, because God has done something even better for us. He's offered his own begotten son. The sacrifice of animals always pointed to the one greater and complete sacrifice, and that Jesus made. He became the sin offering to secure our freedom. When he went to the way of the cross and when he gave up his life and shed his blood, he made the payment of, <clears throat> that God demanded to free us from the condemnation we deserved. On that day when he died and rose again from the dead, reminders of our sins became a reality of total forgiveness. Yes, our forgiveness demanded a great price. This is why the law is and always remains powerless to save us. It can only make demands, and we fall short of it. It demands total obedience, but it gives no strength to obey. This is why we need to cling to our Savior and the Word of, uh, and the, and grow in the Word. A good example might be a person falling off a sailboat. His hope of rescue fades as the boat drifts further and further away. We're pretty much like that drowning person. But what Christ has done for us and the Holy, and the Holy Spirit's gift of faith, we have that lifeline that is always tethered to the boat and to safety. Our efforts would do nothing but lead us to sink in our sin and our guilt. Our only hope for rescue comes from the Lord himself. That lifeline is his son. And by means of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, he draws us to himself and rescues us from the condemnation we deserve. We desperately need our savior and his work. We need him to be the sinless sacrifice to give us freedom from condemnation, the condemnation we deserved. We also need him to give us new life. And this is what Paul also tells us Jesus became the spirit of life to spare us. Paul makes it very clear in this epistle to the Romans, there have been and always will be two forces of work within us, life and death. The law, namely God's demand for perfection, shows us all too well 
Death has taken hold of us and is leading us to eternal destruction. The gospel, on the other hand, namely God's grace in Jesus, shows us a different picture. It tells us that there is a new life, a better life at work within us, and this life was purchased by our Savior. We are no longer powerless to resist Satan, for Christ's redemptive work has, has defeated the power of sin, death, and Satan. The wages of sin is death, and this sentence all deserve, and we all deserve this sentence. But death is more than just not being alive. The death we, we deserve is eternal death. A death without end, a tortured, filled, horrible death, and yet the death we deserved was endured by our Savior. This is why Paul led us to rejoice. Thanks be to God that he spared us from that death. By means, of, <clears throat> by means of his work and because of the law of the spirit of life is, it is, is in us. It is this life, this freedom of the fear of death that is at work within us. Surely we want to keep that, <clears throat> to keep this law at work within us. This certainty, this law that we will no longer are, are condemned to eternal life. This is why we need to remember that we are under a new law, and it's a better law, a law of no condemnation. As we know, God's laws are the statutes by which he proclaims his will and establishes his order. The old law, namely what he established in the Old Testament, brought condemnation and death by uncovering our sins. Through Jesus Christ, God the Father established a new law, one which brings undeserved love and blessing. Paul appealed to the Christians to Rome to live under this new law as a certainty of forgiveness and sins and there was no condemnation. He appeals to us as well. His reason is simple. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Throughout our lives, we will see abuses of justice. We will see things which deserve us, disturb us and make us wonder if there is justice. Before we question God, remember God is not slow to maintaining justice. He will come and he will pour out the ultimate condemnation on all people who are not in Christ Jesus. We can escape that, that wrath and condemnation. The faith in Christ Jesus that the Holy Spirit has gifted to us to believe in the Father's love and the Son's holy life in our stead offers us the certainty of sonship in heaven for eternity. We will face difficulties, but he also gives us comfort and strength to deal with our sinful flesh. But most importantly, he gives us a peace which looks past this life and to eternal life. All of this is ours. We are truly blessed and have riches beyond measure because there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen.